I was doing some large 13-8 stainless parts a year or so ago on an Akuma Horizontal using a 3 quarter 7 flute end mill that had 2 and 5 eighths inches of flute length. Our axial depth was 2.6 inches, our radial step over was 75 thou, and our feed rate was 200 inches a minute. The cut sounded fantastic. Chips were rooster tailing out of the cut for about 30 minutes, and then all of a sudden, boom, the end mill broke and the entire holder flew out of the spindle. We had never seen that happen before, especially during a cut that sounded so clean, so we assumed it was just a fluke and decided to try again. We got back into the cut for about another 20 minutes and sure enough, the same thing happened. We tested our drawbar clamping force and it was a little under the manufacturer's spec, but not by much. We decided that we were probably being just a little too aggressive and even though it added 8 hours to our overall cycle time, we switched over to using a high feed mill. If you're anything like me, you love seeing massive chips flying at super fast feed rates. I've always been a huge fan of high performance milling with super deep depths of cut, lower radial engagement, and machine maxing feed rates. Tools like high feed mills always seemed a bit boring to me, but the fact is that sometimes low depth of cut and high radial is the way to go. So how do you know when to use each method? There are several variables to consider including the amount of material to be removed, your part geometry, fixture rigidity, tooling types and costs, tool geometry and wear, available horsepower, available max feed rate, acceleration and deceleration of the machine's axes, the machine's look ahead capability, chip evacuation, and more. We recently did a few videos where we were roughing steel and stainless using a deep axial cut of an inch or more and a 66 to 100% step over, and some people in the comments were asking why we were feeding it only 50 or 60 inches per minute instead of 500 inches per minute with a lower step over. In these cases, the answer was pretty simple. We were using a big machine with a high torque spindle, and even though we could have programmed these tool paths at 500 inches a minute, the machine would only have physically hit that feed rate during long linear cuts. After testing some programmed tool paths, we found that our actual cycle time was double or triple our estimated cycle time due to direction changes in the tool path. So in this case, we got better material removal rates using a large radial step over and a deep axial step down. Now, not all tools are created equal. I've seen an end mill from one manufacturer last for 10 minutes in titanium, and an end mill from another manufacturer last for 3 hours with the same feeds and speeds. Then again, you might be using a 15 flute Kenna metal end mill in titanium like Jesse did in his swarf milling video recently, and instead of just running at 200 SFM, you're running at 600 SFM. On some machines that are meant for super fast feeding or mold making, you may find that the lower radial engagement and full axial depth gets you a better MRR. Titan did a video a while back where he was feeding in steel at 1000 inches a minute and achieved 40 cubic inches per minute material removal rate with a 3 8 end mill. High performance milling like this will usually smoke a high feed mill or any inserted cutter and it increases the life of your tool because you're getting less deflection due to the lighter step over and you're spreading the wear across the entire length of the flute as opposed to only using the bottom portion of the tool. But what if you need to remove thousands of cubic inches of material? Most end mills aren't going to last for a thousand plus cubic inches in stainless or harder steels. Although the MRR with an end mill will likely be higher, the risk of breaking an end mill mid part usually isn't worth it although this risk can be mitigated using spindle load monitoring. That said, using high feed mills with a low axial depth and a high radial step over is going to get you the most bang for your buck and less problems during the process. But at the same time, you end up with other risks when using inserted cutters like breaking inserts and turning your tool holder into lava against your stock. In the end, you just have to look at your unique combination of machine, software, tooling, and part and make an informed decision on which method is going to work best for you. Both have their strengths and weaknesses, and both methods of cutting can yield incredible results when used properly. Talk to you guys again soon.